uh, exactly what we're doing here with the lamb, but we're going to talk a little bit about the cooking techniques and, and what we do uh, with all the different parts of the animal. And uh, this, this is certainly a demo and it's, uh, it's a little bit of a lecture and a, and a teaching forum also, but uh, the, best, the best way to do this is for it to be interactive, so please uh, ask as many questions as you like, you know, and I think that makes for uh, more of a conversation, which is a little, a little bit more beneficial for everybody. I'm going to have Lisa talk a little bit about more stuff. Thanks. Well, welcome, everybody. Paul, it's um, one twenty. What time is it now? It's It's 
unbelievable. He makes it look really easy, but no pants on. Oh, no. <laughs> He's really doing a lot here. Um, where would you like the conversation to go? Does anybody have a question to this point about, do you want to talk about farms? Do you want to talk about cuts? I'm curious about American land in general. Does that mean um, like every farm that falls under an American land um, umbrella, or is that American land here exclusively? So American lamb means that it's born, raised, and harvested in the United States. And then does everybody who have, say, American lamb, is it all, is, every, is everybody committed to using the entire animal? No. I'm probably the only one in the United States that started my program four years ago, committed to a whole animal program. We were raising lamb and we were raising, you know, 100, 200 lambs a year. We've always sold them off the farm, the whole lamb program. Uh, most producers in the United States sell into the, into the market, which then makes the animals and they don't know what goes on beyond that point. So they would go into the industry, we call it the commodity, um, which ends up in a, a packing house, and it ends up in cases, and it ends up in the cut houses. So, you know, I tell people if they really want to know what's going on with their lamb, Ask how far it traveled. You know, your lamb can travel 10,000 miles if it's coming from New Zealand or Australia before it even hits land. So it can be 10,000 miles to your place. Commodity, uh, American lamb is going to hit the ports, uh, it's going to hit the, the processing plants on the west coast. So it's, it's a lot closer, it's 3,000 miles instead of 10,000 miles. I really like people to think about Maine because Maine's only 100 miles away and it just seems to make sense. <laughs> so, um, are there different breeds of them? There is. There is um, 126 re recognized American breeds of sheep. They're really broken into two categories. You have uh, meat sheep, wool sheep, and milk and sheep. And they all can give you all three products. For the most part, look at the hair sheep. We won't talk about the hair sheep right now. We'll leave that on the side, because they're only our meat. But you have to figure out what product wants to be your primary product. So if you're raising Hampshire's and Suffolk's and Dorset's and you know, ones that are primarily meat animals, their wool is going to be their byproduct. So their wool is going to be a little bit scratchier, a little more durable. Worcester yarns going to be the product that comes out of us. Can you interrupt you for one second just in yep. terms of where we are in the process here because Richard is sort of breaking down Please. some of the, the fanciest cuts right now. Richard, you want to tell so, me um, that was on? the saddle. The back half of the, the saddle. We took off the tender ones first. That's this. And then um, the back end, um, like the butt, I use that. That's that's what the merguez is. Um, that and shoulders and uh, a lot of flat meat. You make bacon out of this, but these are the these are the loins. So if you're thinking about the high end cuts, you really only have your racks and your loins, right? We'll have to get back to the, the wool and the meat animals. Um, if you're talking about your high end cuts, you're talking about a third of your animal. Your value of the animal is going to come out of the third of the cut, which is going to be your loins and your racks. Traditional white cloth. Everybody knows what rack lamb is. Everybody knows what loin chop is. The other two thirds of the animal is going to go somewhere. It's got to have a value to it also. We call them mid cuts. And the mid cuts are the legs. And I was really glad that you said that because I truly believe that the legs and the shoulders need to be treated almost the same when you're working on dishes and your braisings and your roastings. A nice animal has really good shoulders to it. And then you have your utility cuts your belly, your stew, your trim, your neck, and your shanks. And you want to, if you're a farmer, you want to make sure that that animal has a third of its value on each of those. So that if your chef is going to do three different dishes out of a whole animal, he's able to make a return for that dollar. And why is, why is the loin so prized? So, the loin is the most tender of the cuts. And across the bag, if you saw before we went in, we had this area right in here, the mid cut. You guys are going to get a little cutting board that's going to show this. The muscle doesn't move. 
So if a muscle doesn't move, it doesn't get worked, which means it doesn't toughen. So the muscle across the back is going to be the most tender cut because it doesn't have any movement to it. The legs and the shoulders obviously have more movement to them, so they're a mid-branch cut. And then your neck, the legs, your feet, they move the most. So they're going to be your toughest cut. Really easy, it's not complicated with layout. High-end cuts, high-price cuts, cook them fast and high heat. Mid-range cuts can take a medium, a little bit longer cut. Your utility cuts, slow, slow and low. So, so Louie, how would that translate to the menu we're going to see in a little bit today? Sure. So there's a couple of different things going on with the menu, which I don't have to tell you. But, uh, thank you. Okay. So the first course, you're looking at what you use for the uh, first here. First course? Uh, Lamb biryani, you're looking at neck, spray neck. Okay, so we, we rub the necks up, the nice spice rub, okay, after we brine them. Uh, and then we sear them all the way around and we braise them until the meat's like falling off the bone. Okay? Take it off. Yep. And uh, the, the neck is a, it's a prime cut for me because there's, it's, A, I think it's the, the best part of the lamb for braising. Uh, you get a really, really rich uh, meat off of it. The, the gelatin content in the neck is higher than the other areas that you would braise, so you get this super luscious, like rich meat out of it. It also, um, where the uh, where the, where the other parts of the lamb are that you would braise, uh, tend to break down faster. Um, the neck maintains a lot of the integrity of like its um, its, its texture, even after it's been braised for hours and hours and hours. It still has a little bit of chew to it, which is really nice. Uh, and then we mix it in with uh, what you throw in there for um, yeah, so, carrot, celery, onion, garlic, fennel, uh, lots of lots of spices. Right, you take the braising liquid, reduce it down so it's like a sauce. Fold the braised lamb back into it, and then uh, we have these little um, ramekins that we fill with the with the braised meat. And then we took basmati and wild rice and cooked all that and packed it on top. And then we bake it all together, and then we turn it out onto a plate. So when you get it, it's the rice on the bottom with all the braised meat on top. And it's like a traditional uh, Indian dish. Uh, when you get to the roasted leg of lamb, these were also brined and then spice rubbed with uh, harissa and mustard and uh, orange and fennel pollen. And then they were uh, they were they were rotisserie back there in the back of the kitchen, which again was in mind, we kept in mind with uh, what we were doing at the table with all the butchery we we're going to be doing. We wanted to be able to throw hams up there, do lamb legs up there, do chickens, all kinds of stuff in the rotisserie. So we did. The, uh, the legs right in the rotisserie, nice and slow. Uh, great, the rotisserie provides really even browning all the way around and great caramelization, nice and crispy skin, and then uh, it doesn't it doesn't ever it burn the the meat, so that it, it can go forever in there. I mean, you've you've seen this with chickens; they just sit in the rotisserie for hours, you know? but then you get it; it's still beautiful, and the, the meat's super tender in the inside. And uh, we're gonna do this with the merguez sausages. So the Sausages, merguez is a pretty specific recipe. It's pretty traditional. Uh, it sort of runs the gamut of peppers, uh, any, everywhere from the sweet bells to uh, you know, really spicy, like jalapenos and Thai chilies, things like that, and everything in between. You try to find a nice pepper mix to go into your uh, your lamb sausage. Uh, also, the paprika is a really key ingredient in there. Uh, garlic, fennel seed, another really important ingredient in there. Cumin, and we toast all the spices here and, and make a nice spice mix for the merguez. Okay. Uh, we're going to do that with uh, uh, squashes that we got from Sparrowark Farms uh, actually at the end of the summer, right in the fall, and we just kind of have them on display here, but uh, one of the things we also do here is we try to try to extend seasons, so you'll see like all of our preserves and things like this down here. Uh, the empty shells were all uh, tomatoes from the end of the summer that we made preserves out of, and we just ran through them uh, last week, we got through all of our summer tomatoes. So we're able to take a season that lasts traditionally two and a half months and extend it to like you know six or seven months if we're lucky if we can really bulk up on product. Uh, the red pepper, saffron, couscous, uh, mint remoulade. So this is a very Moroccan style dish. Okay. Uh, when you get to the lamb hot dog, um, we got robbed at Koshan this year. Uh, we're totally supposed to win. <laughs> that was incredible. The lamb hot dog should have won. Yeah. We had a banging hot dog. 
And uh, we, want, we want to show it off again. It's actually going to make a, an appearance on the menu come, come April. But uh, uh, the hot dog is like, it's, it's not even a hot dog. It's like charcuterie, okay? This is, it's, it's really fat, uh, super fatty, really luscious, really rich. And uh, we did some, uh, some pickle relish, shaved onion, just like you would get in Chicago. Like really simple. You don't mess with hot dogs. <laughs> and, uh, and then we get into the primals. And we're gonna do uh, the, the rack and the bowling for you. The, the main course um, in cassoulet style. We took a lot of that meat trim and we, uh, we, we started in a pan, got it uh, nice and caramelized and then went in with, uh, with our, our beans also. Uh, yeah. These guys here are also from Sparrow Arc. Uh, the fun part about working with beans from a guy like Matt up in Maine is that you don't have to soak them. Uh, these are from this summer. They never need to be introduced to water. You just go right into a pot with them. They cook up in like an hour and a half, two hours. No problem. And, uh, and you, can, they, you can taste the difference. They're super starchy, like really sweet. Uh, you can taste like freshness in the, in the bean, if that makes any sense. And, uh, and that's gonna be our cassoulet. Um, so we tried to find uh, some globally inspired dishes. We wanted to find uh, all corners of the world and show off uh, how, how to cook uh, lamb and interpret it into different types, types of cuisines. So you can see that uh, even though it's American lamb, there's so many things you can do with it, you know? And it really all depends on, you know, what your comfort level is uh, with cooking and, you know, maybe a little bit of your background, how you grew up, and finding ways to interpret it into your style, you know? And here, uh, we can show you, we'll show you just on this menu four different ways. So that's the, that's the high-end area, believe me. I say, get a fresh cut of lamb, yeah. stop it here, throw it in your pot, or here in New England, I supply the local lamb for Whole Foods, so stop in the Whole Foods, grab a cut of lamb, take it home, put a little pepper on it, and just enjoy the freshness for what it is. And then come out and, and get great, <laughs> great dishes from, from these incredible chefs on the menu. So I have a question for you guys. So you, you buy the whole lamb and you do this. How many lambs do you buy? Like if you have some lamb dishes on the menu, yeah. how many of these do you butcher a day or a week? Or no, a we get, we, when, when we're in season, meaning we're really busy and we're, we have a uh, lamb on the menu, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's a lamb or a pig or whatever it is, we, we go through about one a week. One a week? Yeah. And I have, um, I work with 27 of the James Beard chefs on my food service side. So let's say a 42 seat restaurant um, in Portland, uh, they can go through two lambs every single week. Mm -hmm. And what has been really cool about the way they've started menuing it, we, you know, people aren't coming in anymore and asking if there's rib chops on the menu. Mm -hmm. They're coming in and saying, do you have North Star lamb? And they'll plate it as either North Star two ways or North Star three ways. And that way they can mix up the, the pieces so that they can give a really incredible dish without having to just go through those, you know, with one lamb you've only got 16 loin chops. You know, and if you have 42 seats, I'm hoping that half the people are going to want lamb in the first hour, so. so it allows them to add a utility cut, add a mid range cut, and add a high end cut to the plate and move across the animal. And that makes it sustainable for me and for the restaurant to be able to sustain my program. What are you feeding the lambs? So my lambs are raised on um, certified organic grass lamb. Philip and I build all of our own grass hay and our own alfalfa for the winter. They receive no GMOs, they receive no growth hormones, they receive no corn and no soy. So our flock is sustained on grass. And the other 10% if they need it, like this winter when it's really cold, it's really the old girls, the mothers that need it more than the lambs. But, um, and by the way, a lamb is 150 pounds when it gets to this point. So these rams are about this tall. And there's a reason they're called rams. They're not cute lambs anymore. You're ready for them to go and It's an ongoing thing with the industry whether you should be calling it lamb. Yes, you should be calling it lamb. Um, so they're about six months old at that point? Six to eight months old when they go to market. And we keep several different breeds. So smaller breeds take longer to get the market weight so that we can fulfill our market on an annual basis. So they can be born when they naturally want to be born but it takes longer for them to get to the market depending on the size of the mothers that are actually having the lamb. So the big black face get to market first, and the rams, and then the white face, and then the primitive breeds, the Icelandic, the 
Scottish black face and the Chevy So they fall when they take them long to be sure. That's why we're able to supply our market on a year-round basis without having a negative impact on the animals. Um, and to answer your question, we feel that there's some good value in having a dog that's not going to be a problem for us. Yeah, that's why we have a lot of our dogs that are going to be able to be a good one. So Bill and I, uh, Shipyard brings in all of this fed grains to the farm, and we use that as our supplement feed for the ewe flock during the winter. We also go around with our trailers, and it's a pretty good job to have on the evening, but we go around and we pick up all the local brewery grains, and Foundation, Bissell Brothers, Rising Tide, um, all of that goes back into the ewe flock. So we're able to take live product and make it into a product. We completely remove conventional grains from the program. But we're really proud of that. And that really has made the farm sustainable. <laughs> and it's great for the brewery too because they don't have to pay to get rid of the waste anymore. And it's a great product. I mean, it's, it's a great product. We do a compost also. So nothing gets wasted on that farm. Is there a difference in the taste of the lamb? Is there a difference in the taste of the different varieties of lamb? I do not believe that there's a difference in taste based on breeds as long as they meat breeds. If they're a heavy wool breed, they're going to have a little bit more of a level of taste. If they're a meat breed, it's based on how they're raised and what they're fed. And if environmentally they're all fed the same, green grass, fresh water, fresher is always going to be milder and milder is always going to taste better. So, the main is closer to the new one. 